Uh, thank you, Gao. So first, uh, let me add my welcome uh, to my hometown. I actually grew up here and uh, went to school here, spent many of my formative years here. So it's really glad to have actually uh, the faculties and the distinguished guests from all over the world come here to Shanghai for this uh, faculty summit. Um, we have one hour for this session. It's uh, about Internet of Things. And what I'm going to do is to spend a minute or two to talk a little bit about some of those uh, historical background. Um, I think it's useful to actually, uh, when we discuss the future and the potential opportunities, it's actually useful to think a little bit about history. And I think as a ch uh, Chuck Thatcher actually had a very uh, nicely done in the earlier session, is, uh, you know, I, um, I'm reminded by uh, Gordon Bell, who uh, many of you know that, who is a pioneer in computing and earlier worked as a chief designer for the, for the VAX machine at the DEC. And uh, Gordon Bell actually posits that every decade or so, there's a new computing client device come to, uh, to life. And from the earlier, say, uh, you know, 1960s, the mainframes, to the mini computers, to the personal computing, and uh, to these increasingly smaller and uh, cheaper and, uh, and, and more affordable devices, such as you know, the, uh, the smartphones, the cell phone devices. And what Gordon says is that uh, one of the things that's emerging is sensors, or networks of these embedded sensing devices. Now, the sensors actually come in various forms. Um, you know, the one name that uh, people have been using to refer to this field is wireless sensor networks. Uh, there's a few other names, uh, other devices such as RFID. These are radio frequency ID tags, you know, tiny electronic tags that you attach to objects that if you actually shine a electromagnetic wave to that, it will actually send you various information about what the tag has recorded. Um, more recently, there are also this notion of cyber physical systems. Now, cyber physical systems refer to these uh, collection of these sensors, and more importantly, there's also actuation devices. So in that sense, it actually combines sensing and computation and reasoning with actions on the physical world. So it's in some sense, it's closing the loop of the, uh, of the system. Now, this entire field of sensors and uh, CPS and so on, often the time also referred to as uh, IoT, the Internet of Things. So this is the topic of today's uh, panel discussion. Um, a few years back, the uh, Stanford Research International had published a report. Um, it, it describes a few of these interesting application scenarios, and also it predicts some of those future trajectories or possible trajectories for the IoT technology. And you can clearly tell that uh, the technology actually starts with some niche areas areas that has to do with, for example, supply chain management, tracking goods, inventories, warehouse you know, uh, uh, you know, goods uh, movement, and the two things like surveillance, securities. So these are, I would say, very niche, very vertical uh, areas where sensors, FIDs, IoT technology could find its home. Now, as the technology becomes more and more mature, you expect that that's going to actually move out to reach more and more audience, in particular to reach the consumer uh, market. So things like locating people, locating objects, and be able to actually play a critical role in healthcare, in transportation, in things that has to do with actually helping people managing daily tasks, interacting with the world, go about doing things. So this is what uh, one of the prediction of IoT may come about in the next uh, 10 to uh, 20 years. Now, with all these different terminologies of sensor net, RFIDs, CPS, the cyber physical systems, and the internet of things, what I think some of the really interesting components that as a research community, as technologists, that we need to actually really think about are really three things. I think the first is really about these sensor devices. You know, whether these are tags, these are tiny wireless sensor modes, these are nodes, that need to be affordable because you actually wanted to deploy quite a large number of them 
and you don't want them to be small in many cases because the form factor actually matters in those cases. And in many cases, also you're going to operate untethered. So you need to be very power conscious or power efficient. And you want them to last for years without human have to actually change the battery and to replenish them. I think the second part is really important is to think about how you're going to network all these points or these devices together to be able to collect the information to be able to act on the physical world. So isolated points, the sensor nodes, are not very useful unless they are actually all collected and become an ensemble that you'll be able to sense a very large patch of the physical world that we interact with. I think the third piece that's, I think, probably the most important one is really about the data. The device is going to get a lot of this real-time information about the environment around us, and how do we turn these multitude of those signals into very valuable insights about the world, and more importantly, something that we can act on. Now, two things to keep in mind when we actually think about taking technologies from uh, research from the labs into innovations and into the real world uh, applications is to actually think about some of the things that uh, Gordon Bell uh, mentioned er in the earlier slide is that uh, when technology come about to be a mass production, you need something that's called a standardization that allows innovation to occur in parallel on different parts of this entire system. So that when all these things come together, they can work with uh, clearly defined uh, interfaces. So I think that that's one of those uh, really key ingredients actually for us to think about when we actually think about IOTs and the applications. I think that the other one is really think about the driving applications. A few killer applications is really important to actually move the field forward to build the ecosystem of all these different things from hardware components to the design communities to the people who are writing apps and develop tools for, for supporting these. So, with this, I'm going to introduce our distinguished uh, panel. We have uh, four panelists, and they are David Culler from uh, UCLA, uh, I'm sorry, from University of California, Berkeley, and Hide from uh, Keio University, Japan, and Professor Chen Guihai from Nanjing University, and Catherine Van Ingen from Microsoft Research, Redmond. So, let us uh, invite the, uh, the panelists to come to the stage. Yes. And the, uh, the first uh, panel presentation is, is to be given by uh, David Culler. And a very uh, quick uh, introduction of uh, David. David is a professor of computer science and also the chair of the computer science division of, uh, of UC Berkeley. And uh, he's going to talk about the intelligent energy and how IoT sensors and technology like this could actually change the way we think about energy production, transmission, and consumption. So with that, David. wireless sensor. And I take it the, uh, that time is not, uh, not just mine. Thank you. So in, in large part, uh, in my view, the technology of internetworking devices embedded in the physical world, we've been working at it for 15 years. It's largely, from a research point of view, a solved problem, which is that really to say that the technology now gets to live in the world and make a difference. And that's a lot of the emphasis that I'm going to take here. If you step back and think for a, a second at the electric grid, a paragon of the industrial age and industrial age design, um, amazing the way we produce this precious commodity and deliver it through an energy supply chain from generation, transmission, distribution, and demand to millions of customers over thousands of miles. And oh, by the way, Nobody ever places an order. There's no uh, inventory anywhere in the supply chain. You know, synchronized, phenomenal accomplishment of a world when energy was cheap and information was dear. So in some sense, that's the situation's been reversed. 
we see the fragility of this as we start thinking about going beyond a carefully controlled portfolio of, of uh, generation supplies, what we call dispatchable resources, to renewable resources. The sun shines when the sun shines, the wind blows when it blows. That this notion that we can carefully generate supplies that are tailored to a predicted demand starts to disappear. The only way we'll get the overall system to solve again is if you can imagine creating a new kind of load, a set of dispatchable loads that are able to consume energy when it's available, hopefully in precious amounts. And in order to do that, fundamentally, that means that they, the loads need to be in to communicate with the supplies. The supplies need to be able to communicate with the loads. In effect, that we start to think about an energy network rather than just an energy grid. So, this is a set of questions that for the last few years we began investigating in the low-cal project. That's both localized and hopefully low uh, calorie uh, in that sense. At Berkeley, I wanted to just give you a, a sense of that in a couple of minutes to, to tee this up. So question here is where to start, how to start, how do we begin to transform these fundamental institutional infrastructures? One answer is buildings. Um, three quarters of the electricity is spent there. So, you know, like banks, that's where the money is. So you might start there. Um, it's about half of the overall footprint um, and doubling. It is also where many of the, from a greenhouse gas point of view, the, the most serious um, sources are used. It's also the primary target for renewable supplies. Much easier than cars. They stay put, they're predictable, they're great big sources. <clears throat> so, in some sense, we're both focusing on the network and the clients of the network, of which buildings are the dominant one. So then how do we start? So we might imagine we'll go build a complete new electric grid from scratch, and how many decades will that take? The answer is no. And so the real message of my talk is that the internet way of thinking about large-scale system design is going to be as influential as any of the technologies that we develop along the way. And for example, the internet began as an overlay on the phone network. Well, the grid exists, the internet exists, the future energy network in some sense already exists if we think about it as an overlay on both of those networks that map down to where we can talk about energy subnets, we can talk about horizontal layering, we can talk about technology transformation, and we utilize the underlying grid to move the electrons, the underlying internet to move the bits. In fact, the way that we can begin to innovate rapidly, because the other part of the internet is distributed innovation, is to take that all the way to begin thinking about virtual private grids, where you get collections of sources, classic portfolio resources, renewable, and communities of loads that actually work together and communicate. The real issue here is bringing in a style of design where rather than vertical integration at some particular point of time which dominates things, we begin to think about horizontal stratification around a narrow waist. We think about how is it that we structure the design so that while it may be suboptimal at any point in time, technology underneath can evolve rapidly with the existing body of uses. And equally importantly, the new applications can come into existence on the technology and that those can now drive forward in a virtuous cycle and one of distributed innovation. This is a sense of some of what we put together. Uh, we focused all the way down, yes, of course, little teeny devices, the thing that you left you see is an internet capable, very high quality. Uh, digital electric meter, we can sense anything, but of course all of the legacy equipment in SCADA networks and the rest of it need to be brought into a common web-based infrastructure. And the sense on the right is the huge innovation of application development. Facebook, yes, becomes placebook for buildings. Uh, undergraduates taking cell phones, you point their camera to extract a QR code to get the energy consumption of the building, the environment, the things you care about, this rich body of information which now begins to give you a framework for optimizing in a context where things are what really matters. And with that, I think I'd like to stop, just end with the concept that each of the endpoints need to monitor, model, and mitigate their demand. The smart grid is smart endpoints with a dumb core. 
and that can communicate to supplies and from supplies so that forecasting, tracking, marketing, and conforming to availability and price become the norm rather than the exception as it is with all of our other networks. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, our next uh, presentation is uh, by Professor Hide Takuda. Um, professor Takuda is the Dean of the Graduate School of Media and Governance and a Professor of the Faculty of Environment and Information Studies at the Keio University. And, uh, his uh, statement uh, presentation uh, is a sensor-enabled cyber-physical coupling for everyday objects. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much for a kind introduction. Um, my group has been working on the ubiquitous and pervasive computing in the last uh, 10 years. And then um, in five minutes, I try to talk about sensor enabled cyber physical coupling for everyday object. When I was in Carnegie Mellon many years ago, uh, I was working with Rick Rashid, and uh, I was very happy to see him again. Uh, I did notice he wear the same tie, but anyway. Um, my um, main question here is, um, is Rutla low cost wireless sensor node is better than RFID or not? Uh, in terms of IoT, some people think about RFID, but the uh, claim here is I argue you that coming future ultra low cost wireless sensor node is much, much better than RFID. Okay, let's look at my old work. This is about five years ago, we attached a bunch of low cost sensors to every object. Maybe one is like uh, orange like this. No one buy the orange with the sensors, but uh, we wanted to attach everything. Okay, then uh, not only the traceability of the object, we really look at the state of the object in the real space. So in some sense, we really would like to look at the real object or everyday object in our real space. Okay, I classified into the following zones. At the bottom, you can see the real space. At the very end, you can see the body, and then room, we call the A zone, and the building, we call the B zone, and then outdoor um, in C zone, and then outdoor, and then D zone. The D, D zone, D stands for disconnected zones. C stands for connected zones. When you create the many services, we really would like to go back and forth between two. Some cases, some services are available only under C zones, where you are connected to internet or connected to the GPS. So the C zone is most easy to implement the services, but we really would like to go back and forth. Okay, uh, another aspect is suppose X is an uh, object like uh, this water, bottle of water, you really would like to know this water comes from where. So as Fen says, if I have a mobile phone, I can look at the QR code, and then one click away, I can get the attribute of the other object in the cyberspace. So the cyber physical coupling is indicated by this kind of vertical arrow. At the same time, if X is a location like a Shanghai, Y is the airport, I really would like to move from X to Y. I have to search the path uh, in the real space. By looking at the uh, Google or Bing, uh, you can look at the path from uh, location X to location Y. So these are the, one is the attribute of object or state of object. The other type is the like movement of the object. And many things you would like to couple uh, by coupling the between two objects, one in real space, one in cyberspace, you really would like to create the services. Okay, so my concern for the future internet of the things is by having a ultra low cost wireless sensor node may create better services, better innovations. So, um, so my answer is, Yes, 
for better cyber physical coupling. So let me look at the, uh, some of the services we created five years ago. It's called the Smart Object Services UK Applications. Uh, these things are challenging ones, like a binding problem. In uh, uh, ordinary house, we have more than a few thousand items. If you attach ultra low cost sensor node to every object, how can I bind between two? And then how can you deploy yourself, do it yourself deployment? How about privacy issues or personal behavior modeling, monitoring, and a lot? These are the technical issues. Uh, we have some scheme called the spot and snap. These are the object, these are the web camera, and then with the light. When you take a photo of uh, this kind of uh, object, we call the smart object, we shoot with the light. And then these are the other sensors, but only this sensor will have a high value in the light sensor. Okay? Then we capture, at the same time, we capture the still image. So we transfer the real space to the phys real space to the cyberspace. So by having this kind of uh, uh, viewer, you can see the state of the object. If you turn off the room light, you can see everything is at the bottom. Okay. So let's look at the one example um, here. You care. With UCARE, users can watch over elderly person living alone. UCARE delivers usage data of elderly persons' belongings to users who are his or her family or caretaker. These are the tiny sensors. So this is for debugging mode, but all you need is a behavior model. Once something is different from the ordinary case, you can send a lot message to him. Continuing to use UCARE, users may recognize elderly persons of normality when there is difference of usage status compared with usual status. Alternatively, UCARE has a potential to provide a orderly communication between family and elderly person. Okay, so these are many years ago. Nowadays, you have a social media. So you can hook this event the into DIY the Twitter, and then you can have some kind of data mining to create much better life. sophisticated uh, um, services. So let me stop here and then pass to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Takuda-san. Um, our next speaker is uh, Professor Chen Guihai from uh, Nanjing University. And he's going to speak on the uh, Internet of Things in China. Um, some of you probably heard that in China, there's actually a terminology in Chinese. It's called Wu Lian Wang, which is the older rage in the last uh, year or so. And of course, there's a lot of people behind it that's actually working on the research part. So Professor Chen is going to uh, talk a little bit about that. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. <coughs> Sorry. I come from local university, so I'm going to talk uh, about uh, the Internet of Things in China. First, I give my personal understanding of the Internet of Things. I think the Internet of Things is going to make everything as intelligent as our people. So. The Internet of Things should have the four basic functions, such as naming, sensing, processing, and communications. Uh, for naming, uh, that is to say, uh, everything should have a name. For sensing, I think everything should have sensing ability, just as uh, we have five sensing organs. For processing, um, I think everything should have uh, processing ability, as we have brain for thinking. Um, for communication, everything should be connected for communicating as we have, can use language to talk to each other in human society. So my, I can give a simple definition of IoT. That is, IoT is a communication network 
connecting things which have naming, sensing, and processing abilities. Uh, accordingly, based on the four uh, basic uh, functions, we point out uh, the four fundamental challenges which we are determining, we are determining the future of the Internet of Things. Uh, we, if we further consider four challenges, we can have more and more key issues under each challenge. Due to time limitation, I have to go, uh, skip over the details. <laughs> Next, uh, uh, this is about uh, Sense in China. Maybe uh, you, once you have heard uh, Sense in China, uh, because uh, Internet of Things is very hot currently in China. Uh, you know, 2009 is a special year, event, eventful year for Internet of Things because our Chinese Premier Wen Jiabao visited Wuxi, Wuxi uh, City in Jiangsu Province in August 7th, 9, uh, 2009. He made a very uh, uh, important speech and proposed the Sense in China. Why do we need a Sense in China? Because uh, there are many other countries, for, for example, our neighbor, neighboring countries, Japan and Korea, have some similar actions. Also, the United States has uh, the smart planet. Accordingly, our China should have some uh, similar action, some national level action, because it is uh, uh, a scientific uh, uh, year. I mean that uh, science is the most uh, dominating factor for growth, for growth of the economy. China has become the second largest uh, economy. So our China should have its own strategy to continue its economical growth. That's why we, sh we have sense in China to do something along the uh, developing Internet of Things in China. We have determined to build a center for center of sense in China in Wuxi city. Uh, the government uh, um, has already some very detailed plan to build the center of sense in China. Actually, China, uh, many departments is uh, following up with our premier Wen Jiabao's uh, important speech. For example, NSF has already discussed some very important topics for the next uh, 10 years. Among this uh, list, we can see Sense in China and CBS and something like that. As a professor in China, we usually have three channels to apply for research fund. They are National Science Foundations and uh, uh, Ministry of Science and Technology and uh, uh, Ministry of Industry and Information uh, Technology. All of such departments have set up uh, special projects of the Internet of Things. Also, universities in China are uh, acting. Uh, you see, Nanjing University of Posts and Telecommunications is the first university to establish College of Internet of Things. Just one month after Premier Wen Jiabao made an important speech. Also, just uh, uh, not long ago, the Ministry of Education has approved 30 universities have the rights to establish the College of Internet of Things. I think uh, for the future, I have one prediction. Uh, maybe in the near future, we will have the University of Internet of Things. Because here is the reason. We have three layers for the Internet of Things. Um, they need the collaborations of many departments, such as computer science, uh, communications, and uh, control, and electronics. But uh, these are the small three layers. I propose big three layers, which covers um, technology, economy, and the culture. We need a wide cooperation of experts, not only coming from nature science and technology, but also coming from social science, economy, and the business. Um, only in this way we can support, we can realize our dream, we can have some uh, hundreds or even uh, hundreds of mi millions 
revenue from the Internet of Things industry. So uh, today we come together, but this is just the beginning. We need to keep together in order to get the progress. Most importantly, we need to work in together. We need to the wide cooperation of experts coming from all experts uh, or all uh, fields to ensure the final success. Uh, finally, I have a dream. One day, everything is a computer or everything is a piece of service. Our computer scientists should uh, work together with other people for the dream, for this dream, for the Internet of Things. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chen. Um, our next speaker is uh, Catherine Wang, and, and she's uh, a partner software architect in the uh, Microsoft Research InScience Group. And uh, she will speak about eScience and uh, sensor data. Thank you, Feng. I've been asked to use the microphone. There we go. I wanted to say a few words about how the Internet of Things is changing not only how we go about doing science, but also the science that's actually being done. Is there a clicker? For the past year, I've been working with a number of collaborators attempting a very modern sort of science, synthesis science. Now, synthesis science is really two different aspects. First, it uses a lot of data from a lot of different kinds of places. Shown on this slide is the data that we're using for one of our computations. It includes sen sensor data from the FluxNet group. It's a number of towers around the world. It includes field data, people going out, digging pits, taking tree rings, as well as historical events such as fires. It includes satellite data from the NASA website. It includes the results of computer simulation, because while satellites are great, they don't see well through clouds. You have to gap fill. Simulation is the way of doing the gap fill. It also includes two different categorical maps that have been assembled by group wisdom over the past century, one associated with the current plant coverage and the other a climate classification. So lots of different data all coming together. The other characteristic of synthesis science is the breadth of the science. One of my colleagues says, physics wins, but biology is how you work it. The collaboration that I'm working with has biometeorologists, plant scientists, soil scientists. I thought at first they were all the same. In fact, they're all quite different. Our ability to work together is what enables computations to span the disciplines and lead us to new understanding. One of the examples of the Internet things is the availability of data. We've been running fluxdata.org since about 2007 when a collaboration of 400 scientists around the world got together, donated data to build a global sensor data set for carbon climate science. That's really understanding how plants interact with carbon change. Uh, you can see the network of networks, it's uh, 400 well, actually 500 sites these days. Uh, it's, as far as I know, the largest census data, sensor database on the planet from academic sources. Um, if you know of one, please let us know. There was common processing. Each network maintains its autonomy. Here in Asia, there's Asia Flux and CoFlux, CoFlux in Korea, Asia Flux here in China. Uh, there's also OzFlux down in Australia. I'm showing you one of the uh, sites in the uh, Chinese plantain. A key learning here was that in addition to making data available, it's extremely important to enable virtual conversations between scientists. 400 scientists are working on this data, many of whom have not met one another. We communicate, we track papers, we share information and share data learning through the communications portal. Looking today, we began work, the science computation I talked about on the first slide. That's a case where we cannot simply move the data to the desktop. It's extremely important to move the computation to the data, given the size of the data. So we built, working together, uh, a 
four-stage processing pipeline. The first two stages are common and hide all of the grunge associated with the geospatial lookup, temporal download, and harmonization of the imagery from the scientists. The scientists see only the last two stages. We added the last stage because we realized that when you do a computation at the kind of scale that we're doing, it's important to derive the scientist artifacts, the graphs, the maps that you see here, also in the cloud, also at scale. When I think about the future, the challenges that Internet of Things is presenting to us is how to work together. Once we have done a computation that is at the global scale, how should we interpret it? I grew up in California. I can look at the California map. I have knowledge of California. I have very little knowledge of what the rainforests really look like at the level of detail. The same thing is true for our results in China. How do we work together to understand the results to take the next step for science? How do we engage with the machine learning community so that we don't have to become machine learning experts? And secondly, one of the things that we've realized is the dominant cost by far is people, not computers. What does it mean to do science when computers are free? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Catherine. So we have uh, just heard the uh, opening statement from uh, our panelists, uh, ranging from the interest in really harvesting these rich data sets from all these sensors for scientific uh, research to uh, you know, some of the interesting applications, such as the energy problem that uh, David had ident identified, as well as uh, having sensors in everyday objects that can interact with uh, you know, healthcare and other things and all the way to opportunities that the nation's governments has rise to seize these, uh, these IoT technology in order to actually gain advantage in economic uh, growth. So with that, we actually have, uh, we have about 20 minutes for the audience to actually ask questions uh, and have a dialogue with our panelists. And I believe that, that there are microphones that we have two microphones hold our, by our staff. Please raise your hand if you have a question, and the microphone will be uh, to your hand. All right. So no, you no. see in the uh, in aisles, there are two microphones being passed around. The first question. Uh, yes. Yes, I'm uh, Yu Qizheng from uh, National Jiao Tong University. Uh, I think the speakers have uh, covered uh, many things like uh, energy, science, and uh, health, and uh, even internet. Uh, so the title of the panel is called Internet of Things, uh, which may imply that uh, Internet might be the protocol for the, all, connecting all these things. So I'm wondering, uh, do we need to make any change to the current Internet protocol, the current Internet structure, or um, maybe software uh, to make uh, IoT uh, possible in the future? Thank you. Great. So we have... Uh, two microphones uh, at the table, and uh, I'll have the panelists uh, take, uh, take a turn to share their thoughts. David? So, uh, so I think I, I probably need to lead on the response to that. I've spent the last uh, uh, two years chairing a working group in the IETF, a new experience uh, for some of us. Um, so the short answer is the internet protocol already has advanced. In fact, I think we're going to look back in 2010 will be uh, really the, the watershed year. In some sense, we spent 15 years in research, uh, as uh, Andy Grove said, letting chaos reign, and we have now reigned in the chaos. There were probably half a dozen really important changes we had to make uh, within the IETF body of IP protocols, and uh, next month in Beijing, uh, the Ripple protocol out of the role working group will be nailed down before long. IEEE 15.4e will nail the link layer. So the answer is yes, modifications had to be made. They have been made. And now that real explosion of industrial activity can take off because there's a foundation to start with. Just to add that uh, David is co-chair the IETF working group on that uh, SenseNet protocols based on IP. I, get, I should say it's routing over low power and lossy networks, so it includes power line and many other nasty links. 
Uh, I have a very short, question, uh, short answer, but uh, my answer is yes and no. Um, if you look at the many information appliances in the house, each vendor have a different type of uh, protocols for collaborating among different types of appliances. So yes, between object and object, or you may say machine to machine interaction space, we need higher level protocols. We still need unified uh, machine to machine or object to object, to object protocols. But um, in terms of um, transport layer or link layer, maybe well prepared in some sense. But in the long run, uh, we may need the future internet protocol overall. Okay. For this question, for this question, my answer is uh, we need a new protocol for the internet of things. At least uh, TCP IP, uh, First, uh, TCP IP uh, have already been used for many years, but uh, for uh, the past years, TCP IP didn't consider the uh, resource limitation. In the Internet of Things, everything uh, is limited. So, for example, we cannot have buffering for sending and receiving data. We cannot use three-way handshaking uh, for reliable uh, transmission. So TCP IP, I think, is a heavy burden for the Internet of Things. So we need to some new protocol to replace the TCP IP in the future. Thank you. I'm going to, re I'm going to respond as a user. All I know is you can't take back what I have today. <laughs> yeah, there, there's, uh, there's been many a times where we bet, we bet against IP. Uh, few have won that bet. Um, few will win it in the future. Uh, in fact, even today we have very high quality, low power TCP and UDP. And of course, what happens is that um, where TCP doesn't end up being the right solution, then you end up building an application specific protocol on UDP. And what's so powerful is that you have a homogenization across a wide body of underlying link technologies and that you can bring together different information representations regardless of what link you care. That is such a powerful way of thinking, that separation that, uh, you know, uh, the internet is dead or IP is dead, long live IP. Um, uh, I would be more than happy. I'm sure that we'll back, be back here in 10 years and I'm quite sure that UDP and, ID and TCP will be down in 10 billion of 90% of what the internet is like in its variants that will evolve. Uh, but I also agree that Catherine's right. It's really all about the data, that that's where the value is, and that you need to make sense of it, make sense out of context, make sense out of the representation of it, and that that's where the it, real importance and is. And ensuring continued access. We spend a lot of our time harmonizing what is very different services, so they look as though they're the same. Let's take uh, another question from the audience. Um, Hello. Looks like uh, we'll do that one and then to the, uh, to the left. Oh, uh, Go. Yeah. Oh, uh, I'm from uh, the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, my question is that I think... Could, could, you, you, could you please uh, stand up so that okay. uh, the... Uh, the IoT uh, thing uh, is a science. I think we all appreciate that. But I think more to that is an, uh, a technology, it's an engineering problem. I think one of the things in uh, popular, popularizing this particular technology is actually uh, on uh, how to promote it in the society. For example, like uh, changing the protocol, for example, using IPv6, for example. Uh, I would like to know how the panelists, the respective countries, handle this sort of uh, application problem. How do you promote? IoT in the industry. Anyone from the panel want to take it up? Well, then I will uh, read the first answer then. Um, I guess each industrial segment has a momentum. Uh, some company very eager to move on to IPv6 because of uh, large amount of devices they would like to install. 
Some company very much happy with the private IP before and so on. So uh, for instance, some of the RFID based applications, uh, some companies very, uh, for instance, one interesting application is you have a many clothes and then they embedded uh, stick type RFID to the clothes. And when you wash the things, you can actually easily inventory, you know, what clothes should be fair and so on. So the large amount of clothes controlling the location and so on, they use the stick type RFID. And some of the applications, uh, actually, you can live with the current IPv4 and v6. And then again, uh, each industrial segment has a different culture. Some company just stick with the private ID and that's fine. But some companies, they really would like to have a global address. Then you have to move on to the v6 and so on. Fortunately, some of the Japanese um, ISP providers, they support some of the v6 traffic. And then again, if your ISPs are very conservative, then maybe it's very difficult to penetrate into the nationwide and so on. But what about the government? Is the government doing something? Because if, you, if, it, is a, if it is a commercial deal, it's, uh, usually they are not interested in investing this sort of very risky thing. You really need some kind of government support. I mean, how, what about the government? So, so I think there are a couple of pieces of the question. I'd like to go back to the, the beginning of it when you observed that there's a relationship between the technology we're talking about, the Internet of Things, and the role of science <coughs> in serving society. And I think that's the more important one than the plumbing that's here, that uh, fundamentally what this technology has done is introduced a new kind of scientific instrument. Let's call it a macroscope. You know, when we had the telescope, we came to understand the laws of the, the heavens. When we had the microscope, all of a sudden diseases were things we could visualize. Where theory far outpaces measurement, that relationship now is turning around, and that's where the, the real value is, is, you know. It's like the Dewey Decimal System is meeting Google in so many of these domains that have been extremely limited in their information content up until now. And I think it's a much more powerful driver. If I could say a little bit more as well, David, in addition to just sharing data, we work in an international comp group. So the language barrier is a very real problem when we want to do science together. The internet enables communication not only through email, very often the simplest way to actually communicate with someone of a different language, but also by being able to post pictures, post graphs, post even simple movies to help communicate across time, space, and culture. OK, let's take a next question from the audience. Uh, there was a question from, yeah, there, yes. Uh, Xiao Fanjing, Microsoft Research. So actuation has been mentioned many times as an important part of uh, Internet of Things. So however, unlike sensing, where there are really a few, only a few different modes of sensors, uh, you can often actually integrate a lot of these sensors in a single mode. Uh, for actuation, uh, it's often device specific. Uh, so my question to the panelists are, uh, what is the approach or the right approach so that we can finally reach this sort of the final layer of Internet, internet of Things to complete this feedback loop? Anyone want to take on this question about actuations integrated into this network of sensors? Okay, um, one example we are working on is hooking up a robot into the Internet of Things. Indeed, robot can actually open your door or move around in the real space and then do many things. However, the people who are controlling the robot doesn't have a universal communication protocol or a coordination protocol. So I agree with you in some sense, by creating the better CPS system, we need more coordinated protocol suite for coordinating the actuators in a space, okay? So it's on the way. I think many companies trying to, in terms of robot, uh, trying to unify some of the collaboration protocols. So you can, or even in the buildings, if I want to turn off that light, it's not easy right now. So there are issues, but again, 
uh, many things will be collaborated together and in terms of standard and so on. Okay. I think one thing I would add is that uh, once you have actuators in a network, um, you typically actually have a very uh, interesting loop that's close that. That is that you're taking the data, you make sense of it, and then you act on it. So sometimes if this is a very critical uh, piece of information, you have to act on it within you know, a fraction of a second. The other is that uh, actuator actually draws a lot more power than actually sensing in many modalities. So you have to move mass, you have to actually you know, go about moving things. So think about low power in actuation is actually one of uh, important uh, issues there. I'd, I'd like to take that question on a, a couple of other places. So um, we, we tend to focus, and I think your question focused on the specific actuator, the transducer. Uh, the, the key lesson, I think, is it's uh, layers of feedback system. So in fact, today, I mean, at the lowest level, in fact, actuators are, are quite simple. Most of them are binary and a few are, are linear. Um, that's the direct feedback, the direct control system. Invariably, sophisticated complexes of things are what are called supervisory control. We're really about coordination. And those are in some larger control loop about how it is that we schedule the use. For example, this room is now full of a lot of people, whereas 20 minutes ago it had, had nobody. So the real important thing is that these layers of interacting feedback loops come together. Not that it's difficult to turn something on and turn something off. In fact, if anything, we've lived for 100 years trying to match the transfer function of our sensors to broken actuators so that things were stable in a mechanical world. What's really going on is it's all digital. And oh my god, it's so much easier. But if you're going to act, you're going to affect the world around you. You're going to take action. So securing it, protecting it, challenge response all the way down to the physical devices, the kind of things that we do everywhere else in information technology now need to be brought to a whole world of mechanical disciplines where they've been lacking up to now. Along that line, one of my favorite actuators is the human behind a cell phone when the cell phone is used as a sensor. Almost every one of these actuation feedback loops close around some body of human beings. And, and we talked about the healthcare system. The issue, you know, it's not hard to control that IV system. What's really important is that's tied in with understanding the health of the patient, the particular patient the rotation through the hospital of the doctors. It's these much bigger things. Actually, you know, tweaking the device, that's not hard. Thank you very much. Okay, let's take uh, another question. I see uh, hands over there. Hi, um, Yoshito Tobe from Tokyo Denki University. Uh, it seems that the uh, concept of Internet of Things is still ambiguous, so <clears throat> what's the key challenge uh, which we haven't seen in research of uh, Ubicomp plus sensor nets? So what's the difference? Uh? So this question is about the key challenges that we have not seen from the uniform sensor networks. Uniform probably meaning that uh, a small patch of nodes which are of the same kind that's carefully laid out by graduate students from universities. But how do we go from, from was, there to... Was that the question or whether it's different from UbiComp? UbiComp. Oh, you, you mean UbiComp. So, uh, of course, I think we, we've... Uh, there's two aspects of it. I think uh, Takuda-san observed that RFID uh, may not be the right solution and a tremendous amount of UbiComp has had to do with that particular technology. Um, I would agree with the position that I believe RFID will be as exciting as drum memory uh, before long because it has none of the right scaling properties and uh, so there's a set of problems that are just not worth solving there that we might have some. But the much deeper thing I think is that the Internet of Things is, is approaching what we do in our everyday lives and in our everyday cities. It's not just about waving my hand and having my projection show up on this screen or having some interesting um, uh, entertainment value. That in some sense there's this fundamental seriousness about the complexity of the systems that we're instrumenting and controlling and managing. And so it's not that it worked once in a demo one day, it's that 
the real world, there's no alt control delete on the planet, right? That it really has to work forever. So um, I will add a few, few things uh, related to the previous question as well. From the CPS, cyber fiscal systems point of view, some people often think that we were looking into closed loop, even though human